Good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on now, come on now. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So good to see everybody here. Hey, my name is Glenn. I serve as one of the pastors here. Really glad you're here. Excited to get into the Word of God. Listen, uh, we are a church that spends the vast majority of our Sunday mornings teaching through books of the Bible. And uh, this morning, we get a taste of a really heavy chapter of Scripture that if I could guess, sitting in a room with, you know, a bunch of pastors trying to pick from all of Scripture, what would be, you know, like a text that would really bring just encouragement, you know, positivity to the people of God? Uh, you know, I would not pick this morning's text, okay? We're going to get into a story this morning that's not in, and if it is, that's kind of crazy in mad respect, but I don't think it's in your kid's storybook Bible. Uh, I want to invite you to open up to the first book of your Bible, the book of Genesis, and I want you to meet me in Genesis chapter 19. This was personally sort of jarring for me to study through this week and in Uh, last week in preparation for today. Uh, This is a dark, dark chapter. In fact, this may be one of the darkest chapters in your Bible. And we're going to walk through the whole thing. And here's where we're going. I just want to like jump in. This morning, I want to use the text of Scripture to, to demonstrate to us clearly that God calls us not to settle. God calls us He says, church, don't compromise. Be people of conviction. Uh, Trust me when I say something that is true and good and when I say something that is wrong and evil. Follow me in the midst of a crooked world that does not. And I want you to know much is at stake. God's calling us to persevere and, and live with courage. And so... Um, you know, I thought through what's, a, what's a, a great story that I could tell at the beginning of this to sort of invite you into this, and um, there's not one, okay? I tried. There's not. Sometimes a preacher just can't do it, okay? You're going to be fine, I promise. So uh, the main character in our, in our chapter this morning is a guy named Lot. I don't know if you're familiar with Lot. A um, little bit of context, a little bit of background about Lot. Lot is Abraham's nephew. So If you don't know who Abraham is, um, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis of your whole Bible really tell the story of how sin came into our world through rebellion against God and and brought with it havoc. And um, God, in Genesis chapter 12, begins to unveil to us this amazing, unthinkable, epic story of how he's going to rescue a lost world and reconcile people back to himself. And so the first step that he takes is he chooses this guy who's a pagan, lives in a pagan nation, chooses this guy named Abram. And he says, hey, you, I'm going to call you out. I'm going to set you apart. I am going to make a nation from you and your offspring. I'm going to give you a promised land. And through your family, all the families of the world, the globe will be blessed. Now, we know on on this side of things in 2023 that Abraham's lineage would go down to Jesus Christ. We know that that is the hope of the world. He coming into the world is the, that brings the gospel, the good news of the Christian faith, Christ dying and rising again, and we're going to talk about that. Lot lost his dad. He died, and so he's now with his uncle Abe, and he says, I'm going to go with you. I'm with you. So they depart out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And they begin to head toward the promised land. And something happens along the way. Both Lot and Abraham start to acquire a lot of wealth. They have livestock and cattle and herdsmen. And and all of their things that they have are trying to occupy one big space. And there's lots of conflict between them. So if you go back with me to Genesis chapter 13 in verse 8... Abram said to Lot, hey, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we're kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you. Separate yourself from me 
If you take the left land, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right land, right hand, then I will go to the left. So Abe is basically telling Lot, hey, nephew, we've got a lot of conflict going on right now. It's not in our best interest. We love each other. We're kinsmen. You take a look and pick whatever land you want to start to move to, and I'll go to the other, the other way. And so Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. In verse 11, Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east, thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley, and pay attention to this, moved his tent as far as Sodom. Verse 13, now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. You fast forward after that, you get to Genesis 18, which is right before where we are this morning. And in Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, Abraham had had a, a few uh, visitors come to him. Three men. He discovers one of them is God in the form of a man. He discovers the other two are angels who are just at God's bidding, carrying out his will. Justin preached last week about how God told Abraham what we read here in, in 18 verse 20. The Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very great. Church, do we, are we learning something about Sodom as we're reading here? I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Story last week at the end of chapter 18 is Abraham standing, approaching the, the, the proverbial bench coming to God the judge and pleading, hey, if there's, if there's 50 righteous people in that city, like, would you, would you spare the city for the sake of them? God says, I'll do it. What if there's 45? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? Gets all the way down, bargains God, 10. God says, yes, I'll do it. If there's 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole city from my wrath for their sake. We're gonna see this morning, as Justin alluded to last week, there were not 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom. And the key word in what we just read from chapter 18 is that the Lord has heard an outcry. Y'all, we, we live in a day and age where the thought of God being a judge, the thought of God being wrathful, uh, of sending someone to hell, um, the thought of God carrying out punishment for sin, that's just, that can't be who he is. He, he's, he's kind, he's, he's loving, he, he's, he's, he's always there for us, he's merciful, he's gracious. The problem is that word outcry. If God is not just and God does not judge sin, he silences his ear to all the results of sin in our world. He's not good if he does not exact judgment upon that which is evil. Every sin, every sin, has a ripple effect. The things that God has called you and I as his creation to do, the ways that he's called us to live, the, the things he's called us with our one life to pursue, us ignoring that actually has a ripple effect. It costs people around us. It can, it can hinder the gospel message going forth even through a church like ours in this community when we don't listen and obey God, and that's sin. In the same way, God says, don't do these things. Do not pursue this. Don't run in this direction. Don't chase after that. And when we do, the very things that God calls evil and tells us not to do, there's a cost to it. It ends up hurting us. It ends up hurting people around us. And little tiny seeds of our disobedience, whether they're sins of, of omission things that we don't do that God tells us to do, or sins of commission, things that we do that God tells us not to do, those seeds grow. And there is an outcry here that says, God, are you a God of justice? And if he is, he's going to punish sin. So we get now to this scene. Verse 1 of chapter 19, there's two angels here who have now left Abraham and God, and they've made their way toward the city of Sodom. And the plan is for destruction to come upon this city. And I want to just take in this narrative with you. Genesis 19, verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, 
And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. Pay attention here to verse 3. But he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, two things. Number one, these angels are not, you know, in big glowing robes floating around. These are men. They, they look like men. They're, they're showing up as men. And, and the testimony of the scriptures tells us that even today, church, sometimes we can be entertaining angels unaware. This is the testimony of God's word that there can be angels among the world that look and act and, and appear just as men and women. And so here we are in this text, and that's number one. Number two is Lot knows something. Lot knows something. He's got these two guests that have come into town, and he, he, he strongly urges them, like, come aside, don't stay in the town square, come into my house. I want you to know that in the original language, in, in the Hebrew, he pressed them strongly does not mean that he, he made a strong suggestion to them. It means he literally, physically pushes them. Like, get into my house. Because he knows it ain't going to go well for them if they stay in the town square. Lot knows that this city is a place that's going to be like lions circling bloody prey. So, in verse 4... We begin to understand why Lot responds the way that he does. But before they lay down, the men of the city, and pay attention to all these details, church. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old. That word young is not like a 32-year-old. This is like preteen, teen, every age range. All the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, almost as if to try to spare these angels from what's going to happen and what's going to be said. And he says, verse 7, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please, only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, talking about Lot, and he's become the judge? Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. In Hebrew, to know them. Bring the men out so that we might know them is to have sex with them. This is sexual. What we have in front of us here, church, this is God's word. This is, this is a homosexual mob that has come to this house crying out for an orgy. And there's men, both young and old, from every corner of the city. And clearly word has spread fast. They all show up, they surround the house, they're chanting their demands, they're threatening rape. They're trying to break the door down to get inside. I mean, this is militant. This is a, a, a heavy passage. Something's happened in Sodom that shows us a picture, a type of, of what sin can do. How sin can, can manifest itself in any one of us. Isaiah 3, 9, Isaiah the prophet says, the look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They don't hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. The apostle Paul says in Romans 1, it's describing why we need good news of the gospel and He's pointing to the reality of sin. And in verse 32, he says, they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. 
yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. And here's the thing, homosexuality, sexual perversion, whatever it might be, that's not the only thing that's happening in Sodom. In Ezekiel chapter 16, he says Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. She was, here's a repeat, proud and committed detestable sins. Listen, th- this, is, this is a picture that's, that's maybe hard for us to kind of relate to. Th- this is a city in which they are parading detestable sin, they're mocking God, they're encouraging others to join. I want to say this uh, with as much sobriety as I can, they're flipping the bird to heaven. I mean, they, they are just saying no, no. And this brings us into the territory of God's justice that our human hearts have always struggled to grasp from the beginning. You know, there are um, people here in our church who show up on Sunday with that Sunday smile, wearing the right clothes, doing the right thing, and have for so long been entertaining willingly a a pornography pornographic habit behind the scenes and have just gotten comfortable. Uh, There's people in our church right now who have entertained an affair with someone who's not their spouse and they're showing up here with that spouse and they're sitting down and in the seat here and 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 everything looks fine on the outside but but inside uh, the, the emotional affair that's happening, the text messages, the seeking of attention that's taking place, Whoever you are, you've become comfortable. There, there are people in our congregation this morning um, who, who have children that never, rarely hear from you, I love you, I'm so proud of who you are, not what you've done. Um, there are kids who are not hearing in our church anything but something about the next game, something about the next test something about the next way to to prove themselves and represent the family and are not hearing a story of a God who loves them, who's gracious toward them, who knit them together in mom's womb, who sees them and cherishes them even when they fail. There are people in our church right now who are nursing anger and you've nursed it for a long, long time. You, you might be mad at your spouse, you might be angry at a family member, you might be angry at your boss, a coworker. There's someone in your life where there's unforgiveness, there's bitterness, there's resentment, and it has got such a chokehold on your heart, and you have become comfortable. This is what it looks like. Like if we're really going to talk about parading our sin, if we're really going to talk about how God views our sin, if we're really going to talk about just becoming comfortable and having pride, I've only scratched the surface on the things that every one of us entertains every single day with no sensitivity to what God might think of it. Chief of sinners right here. We, we live in a day and age where we ask the question, God, do you do you really want me to surrender my sexuality to you? As a follower of Jesus, am I am I really expected to surrender all my money to you? God, am I expected to surrender my children to you? Am am I expected to surrender whatever to you? And guess what the answer is? We're only scratching the surface. Yes, everything. Everything. This is what it means for a Christian to take up his or her cross, and follow Jesus. This is a lifelong journey. None of us are there. But there is a road that is paved before us of life and blessing. There is a road paved before us that if we would deny ourselves, if we would actually believe Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Church, we we live in a time right now where we don't understand, there's that little squeak, you hear that? (laughs) 
I've always had that. My dad has always had that. Uh, Proverbs 28.5 says this. Evil people don't understand justice, but those who follow the Lord understand completely. Proverbs 9.10 says the fear of the Lord is just the beginning of wisdom. James 4.6 says, memorize it, please, let's all memorize it. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. God, we pray right now in this moment that you would grant every one of us a godly sorrow. We have departed from you. Each of us has gone our own way. And we're asking that we would not feel the weight of sin in our life just because it gives consequences that we have to deal with but that we would bear the weight of sin because it has been our rejection of you, our sin against you, our rebellion against you. God, we've removed you from your rightful place on the throne. And we are asking right now that you would grant us with kindness and tenderness sorrow that leads to repentance. Amen. This is a lost city Sodom. And there happens to be a guy in the city who has seen some amazing things with his uncle, Abraham. And what I want to do for you is I want to trace out to you now this storyline of Lot and what Lot shows us about compromise. Specifically, what the cost of compromise is in our life. If, If you pay attention to Lot's story, um, all the way back when it says that Lot saw. Step number one, he saw something. He saw the the Jordan Valley. He saw the area of Sodom and and, and the cities. And um, scripture tells us about the the lust of the eyes, right? There's something about us seeing and and wanting something that can be dangerous. And so that's step number one. The next thing we read about Lot is he's he's pitched his tent. He's, He's camped near Sodom, right? He's facing Sodom. So he's, he's not there, but he's closer. Like he disappears for a little bit. The next time we read about him, he's dwelling in Sodom. He's, he's there. He's, he's not outside of it. He's not just looking at it. He's actually walked towards it. Now he's sitting there. And then at the beginning of this text in verse 1, it says that he's sitting at the gate of Sodom. Now, ordinary reading of that, you're not going to notice anything. You know what it means? To sit in the gate, it's a Hebraicism. It means that he is a civic leader there. It means he's an elder in Sodom. That means that he's sitting at the gate. That's where things were adjudicated. That's where strategies for battles and wars were happening. That's where civic leaders came to to settle debates. And this is Lot's progression. Now, follow with me as we keep reading because there's more. The guy is at home. He's quite at home. He's so at home. That when a mob of men come, and and, and he says, I'll reason with them. He calls them my brothers, and he offers his virgin daughters to them. That's how numb this man has become to sin. And if you pick it up with me in verse 10, praise God for his grace. The men, the angels, reached out their hands, brought Lot into the house with them, shut the door, and they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. And then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, don't miss this church, up! Get out of this place, for the Lord's about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. You know what compromise does in our walk with Jesus? It ruins our witness. Here's a man that there's, you read this and you have to assume that these sons-in-law of his, they've never seen the man exercise conviction. In fact, he's coming to them saying, there's angels here. The city's about to be destroyed. Up, we have to go. And they're, he's joking, right? They're laughing. They pay him no heed. This is what a life of indifference, this is what a life of go with the flow, 
This, this is what it does for all of a sudden when we have convictions, nobody takes us seriously. Because our life is not working day by day by day. We, we have these, these huge roller coaster seasons where all of a sudden there's a, a huge surge of emotion and, and we're really passionate about the things of God and we want to vocalize it and tell everybody about it. And they say, weren't you the person that just, just a season ago, like I, you told me you didn't believe in God, like you're in a bad place, you're not sure about that. And now here you are, you know, and then after we see somebody get really excited about their faith, some time passes, we check in on them, how are they doing, they're not going to church anymore, they have no interest in God's word anymore, it was fun for a season, it worked for a season, it doesn't anymore. This is really sobering. If we, we continue, verse 15, the angels are shouting, up, get out, and what does Lot do in verse 16? He lingered. He lingered. And praise God for his grace. The men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. This is where it gets crazy. As they brought them out, one said to Lot, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight and you've shown me great kindness in saving my life. See, I'm trying to like have a conversation right now. But I, I cannot escape to the hills lest the disaster overtake me and I die. I can't do it. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, points at one close by. It's a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. I, I, I just want to say something. I think this is something we are all very familiar with right now. But if an angel throws hands on you, drags you out of a place, says, escape, run, go, don't look back. You say, okay, and run. <laughs> it's not complicated. But there's something in him that lingers. That word means hesitation. There's something in him that that doesn't want to move as fast and flee away from it as much as God is imploring him to. He says, I can't. He lingered. He says, I can't do it. And we're going to keep reading here. God's grace again. Verse 21, he said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Verse 23, the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar and then the Lord. Here, here's a picture, church, before we read it, uh, of the most grave judgment of God, true story, short of the book of Revelation when Jesus returns again. The Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife, behind him, looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Lot's wife looked back. That's not a look of curiosity, that's a look of regret, it's a look of longing. Um, after this, in verse 30 through 38, and I'll, I'll spare us, um, Lot takes his, his daughters to a cave. And there's drunkenness, there's deception, there's incest. Um, there's offspring and ancestors that come from that that actually end up being enemies to God's people Israel to this very day. Nothing good comes of this. And we see that Lot's life may be saved, but his, his legacy is destroyed. Did you hear that? 
Lot's life may be saved, but his legacy is destroyed. Some of us right now, uh, we, we are in the middle of this battle where, um, honestly, whatever your background, whether or not you are a Christian, um, there's three things we see in this text. One is, is a lingering, a hesitation. One is a looking back with longing. And, and one is saying, I can't. And I don't know about you, but have, there's been seasons in all of our lives, I'm sure, where we've understood like the cost of following Jesus that there actually does come sacrifice with a choice to bow our knee and turn from our sin and entrust our life to the one who made us. Um, there is a social cost to it. There are friends and family who would maybe not welcome or receive a decision to follow Jesus. There are coworkers, classmates, who may not cheer and celebrate a desire to pursue God. This text, I believe, is a summons for us from God to believe in Psalm 1, 1 through 3. And here's what it says. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Oh, the joys, the joys. Blessed, blessed, happy are the ones who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around, or, a.k.a. linger with sin or join in with, with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees, church and vision, strong, immovable trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. This is a um, personal thing for me. I remember when we, we said we were going to plant City Light Bennington, and I knew there was going to be plenty of joy. I knew there was going to be plenty of celebration. I knew there were going to be so many people encouraged and met with hope and healing in Jesus. And I know that's happening right now in our midst. We, we're hearing the stories. We're seeing God do miracles here through this church. It's amazing. But there's a cost with, with planting a church in a, in a community. The, a church that's going to hold high and come under the authority of this word. There, there's a cost because we have to accept if, if any coalition of ordinary men and women like, have bowed their knee to Jesus, said, I love you, I trust you, you are life itself. You are my hope. I will follow you. There's going to be pushback in a world that does not follow Jesus. And here's why. Jesus opposes empty, traditional religious activity, and he calls us into repentance and holiness. Here's why. Jesus opposes greed and the worship of material gain, and he calls us into sacrificial living and generosity and selfless service. Jesus opposes the sexual immorality that all of us in so many ways swim in, be it homosexuality, adultery, pornography, lust of the eyes and the heart. And he declares good, holy. Picture of the gospel is one man and one woman who are in a one flesh union. Jesus opposes a privatized fearful faith and he calls us out into bold gospel proclaiming praying teaching ministry every one of us jesus opposes a hollywood love and he teaches us that love rejoices in the truth jesus experiences pushback on all this stuff in his life and his ministry he pushes into people's pet sins the very things that keep us far from God. I want to read you from Ephesians, the Apostle Paul. In chapter 5, I think he paints an amazing picture of City Light Bennington in our day and age. Here, here's what Paul writes. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, not for you. 
Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in these things, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Our name, City Light, comes from Matthew chapter 5. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it loses its flavor? Do you all know that salt, salt preserves? Salt gives flavor. Salt fosters change and growth. Can you make things salty again that have lost their flavor? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Christians in the room, if you're a born-again Christian, I'm here to tell you something this morning. I want to comfort you greatly. Here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you that it's okay for you to be different. You are. I want to tell you this morning, it's okay for your life to be distinct. It is. I want to let you know if you belong to Jesus, it's okay to be unfashionable. You're not fashionable. I want to let you know this morning, take comfort, take heart. It's okay to not agree with the patterns of this world, with today's ideologies. It's okay to stand apart. Take heart. Christian, it's okay to not buy into the group think that you see on social media and in the blogs and everywhere on the internet. It's a terrible place. <laughs> it's okay to let God be true and every man a liar. Across the globe right now, not just here in Bennington, not in Northwest Omaha, not in our state, in our country, across the globe, God has entrusted a message of good news to a generation that is supposed to pass that on to the next generation. What happens in our world, not just right here in our community, in our world, when people compromise? When, when we begin to call that which God calls evil, good. And we begin to call that which God calls good, evil. Where are we left? I, I want to just pray that we would be an Acts 13, 36 church. I don't know if you ever heard that verse before. I would be surprised if you had. Here's what it says. After David had done the will of God in his own generation... He died, was buried, and decayed. <laughs> After David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died. He was buried, he decayed. May it be with us. And I want to close this morning by, by not leaving us without what this light that we carry is. I want to close this morning by not having us go, man, we're trying to like revert back to, you know, just something of the 1950s and kind of this is our aim for like what things are supposed to look like. No, no, we have all been invited into a totally different kingdom. We've been invited into a totally different identity. Christian, you are not someone who has just made some bad decisions and now you're gonna resolve to make some better decisions. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not being a person who has an immoral track record and now you're all of a sudden going to be a moral champion in your life. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not people who are irreligious that decide, you know what, it's time to be religious. I'm going to go to church. That's not Christianity. Christianity is the story of dead people, lost, far from God, separated from him by their sin against him, 
in every possible unique way to all of our stories. And God has come from heaven to make our problem his problem. It's good news that God has seen us in the middle of our lostness. And he's come to us. He's not said, hey, you clean up first. Hey, you get religious first. Hey, you make yourself holy first. L listen to this. I just want to read this to you. We're running out of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't you realize that do those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God. Do you know what it doesn't say? You made yourself cleansed. You made yourself holy. You made yourself right with God. No, no, no. It says all of that happened by you calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. God is passionate that his Spirit that he's placed within us should be faithful to him. There's a story I'll never forget when I was in college. I'm looking at the clock. Okay. It's my senior year. There, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a talent show on campus. And imagine hundreds, I don't know how many were there, college students that show up to the Performing Arts Center at Northwest Missouri State. And, and you've got people doing, you know, the comedy, stand-up comedy. You've got people that are, you know, have bands and they're performing songs and uh, you just imagine, like, the kind of stuff that would be thrown out there when you kind of open up the can and say, hey, we're going to do a campus talent show, okay? Um, I was invited by a group of peers to jump into this skit that I know almost everyone in here has seen. Uh, it's to this song by Lighthouse called, uh, Lighthouse, Light, Lifehouse, Lighthouse, I don't know, called Everything. Has anybody seen this, this skit? Maybe if I describe it, you'll remember it. It tells, it tells the story of a girl who is met with really good news, and that good news is that she was made in the image of God, loved by God. And it depicts her dancing with Jesus, and they are enjoying friendship and counsel and relationship and closeness. And at one point, Jesus, you know, extends her out for one of those little things where you're twirling and you go out and then you come back in, right? And when she reaches out, another hand grabs her. Her hand on Jesus is, is removed. And all of a sudden, she's dancing with someone else. Now, unfortunately, that was me in the skit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is someone who takes her and begins to woo her, you know, dips her down, telling her the things that she wants to hear, um, giving her false promises. The next thing you know, she um, is, is pulled over by someone who has money. And they're, they're just, they keep throwing money before her. And she's like, I got to make money. I need to pursue financial gain in my life. And so she's running after money. And, uh, you know, the next person comes in and one thing leads to the next. And um, just imagine a young girl who she's in a place in life where she uh, she's being pulled by the world she's being pulled by the evil one she's being pulled by lies and deception um, and she gets to a place finally where the last person that she dances with is dressed in all black and puts a gun in her hand and she ends up being in a place where she's so miserable because long ago she was dancing with him. And here she's been entertaining and dancing with and, and, and is so lost. Doesn't know who she is anymore. Doesn't know the purpose and meaning of life. Doesn't know where she came from, where she's going. Doesn't have hope. And she's ready to take her own life. And you know what she doesn't do? She doesn't grab her Bible and read a verse and resolve to put it down and, and, and get up and, you know, dust off her shoulders. Jesus 
at, at the moment of her getting ready to take her life, he steps back into the picture and everyone is pushing on her and she's trying to get up and she can't and all of these different you know, figures in the skid are pressing her down. And finally Jesus comes in and he wipes all of them away and he stands over her like this. And she's untouched while they're all slamming his back and pounding on him and doing whatever they can to get to her. And he's just taking all of it. And in that moment, she stops. And for the first time in a long time, she breathes. There is sobriety that is returned to her mind. She realizes where she once was and what's been lost. She stands up to her feet. Jesus ends up pulling himself up. All of them fall back and they begin to dance again together. Here's the gospel. If you're not yet a Christian in the room, the gospel is that you were made in the image of God. It's that sin separated you from God and you've lost relationship with him because you've gone astray in whatever way that looks. And it's God doing the unthinkable. He's made a way for you to be reconciled to him. He has marched into the story so that anyone, anywhere who believes in Jesus and trusts in Jesus, who bows their knee, repents of sin, would be forgiven and reunited to God forever. Jesus lived a life of sinfulness, sinlessness, excuse me. He did not sin. And he bore a sinner's death on a cross for you. And you know what he did three days later? He rose from the grave and he defeated the enemy that we all have, that we can't defeat, which is death. And he promises anyone who belongs to him a future where there will not be any more penalty for sin. There will not be any more presence of sin. There will be no power of sin. And that future starts the moment a person puts their life in Jesus. So my invitation to anyone in here who has not placed their faith in Jesus is let today be the day of salvation. Like stop making God in your own image like we're all tempted to do and let God be God. Cry out to him and he will give mercy and grace. He does not want anything else for you. Let's pray. God, I'm asking right now that no one in here in this room would believe the lie that with any sin, past, present, they have to do anything but receive from you. God, we pray this morning that we would hear your voice that says, I love you, I love you, I love you. Come back to me, return to me. This is who you're meant to be. In Jesus' name, amen.